Falcons with their four extra EA330 LX high performance aerobatic aircraft. Fantastic show from them, and we're expecting I think today as much as possible. Uh, we have had changes even as late as a couple of hours ago. And just to keep you refreshed on what you can expect to see, this is what it looks like at the moment. So we will kick off the display. In just over 15 minutes time, we have to we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that is something very, very important. The Royal Air Force Chinook, 20 past 12, time, to that wonderful Army Air Corps helicopter, the Lynx. The Rich has just flown in in the muscle pits we've seen here on many occasions before. We'll be putting that through its outstanding paces from RAF Shawbury for a spectacular 25-minute display at 2 o'clock. On from that to another of the Warbirds, the solo Yakovlev Yak-3 of Bob Davy, and then something that's not in your souvenir program, two flypasts from an RAF Airbus Atlas C-1, the A400M, a number of flypasts for us. And then we have a late edition, around about quarter to five, which is that wonderful biplane, the Stearman. And then, if everything goes to plan, we will have the last display item just as we head up to the hour at five o'clock. Into the flying display at very short notice to cover some of these gaps, so a huge thank you to them. Indeed, there is in the souvenir program, there's still mention of a few other aircraft that aren't on the bill today for various technical reasons. The Jet Provost is one, the Catalina is another. That aircraft is still, I think, without its propellers at Duxford. They hope to get that out of maintenance soon. And B-17 Flying Fortress Sally B, which has been temporarily grounded for a few weeks due to a Federal Aviation Authority airworthiness directive affecting all B-17s. The very good news is the last I heard it should fly imminently to that list of aircraft that are due to be here, it really is mouth-watering. There's going to be some fantastic displays this afternoon. It's absolutely into land. Looks very spectacular. Uh, they put a little bit of smoke on to add to uh, to that attraction. But actually, this is a, 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 a normal operational way of landing formations at an airfield. By braking like that, they start to slow down and they start to get in position to land in order. So you often see formation teams do that run and break as it's called but it was uh, a lovely touch to see a little bit of smoke as well today knighted with and uh, we'd also like a Mr. Nazir, a Mr. Nazir to go to the uh, public information tent. It's an important place because also today yeah, it's very crowded. There are around 55,000 people here. Yeah. If you do uh, happen to lose somebody in your party, obviously particularly a child, that is where the child will be taken. There is a children's centre at the information point. So that is where you need to head if you uh, unfortunately uh, have lost track of a child in your group. Can I also suggest, and uh, again, it, it's quite obvious, I'm sure you will, yeah, so please don't do it. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Jonathan. Yes, indeed. We want you to have, and hopefully you're nicely settled. You know where everything is, but I'm just going to remind you to make sure you spend some time today having a good look around, look into all the corners of the showground. There is something absolutely everywhere. The whole idea is this is an at-home day. You can come and see the Royal Air Force at home to meet the men and the women, to see the equipment, to sit in things, get that photo you never thought you'd ever get, like sat in a Red Arrow's cockpit, or as many people were earlier, the centre of RAF engineering. RAF technical training has been Cosford's raison d'etre for decades, and long may it continue. It gives the station such a different feel from anywhere else around the Air Force, and it, and something you will not see anywhere else. I mean, we've no. named that area the Cattery for yeah. reason, but even then, there's two tornadoes. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's special in many, many ways. Um, you've heard lots about the C-130 day already, but uh, for the enthusiasts out there, this is a one-off. This is going to be the last military parachute from an RAF C-130 Hercules by British military personnel. So it is one for the record. Friends have done their display. Uh, it will be time for the RF Falcons to give you the best parachute display in the country. <laughs> a little bit of gentle rivalry there.
Yeah, absolutely. And I have been asked to say uh, on behalf of the French team, they can't send their commentator up here today because he is down on the drop zone. He's also the drop zone safety officer. And we are some distance away from the DZ itself. So uh, I promised him that I will do my best to explain what's going on. Uh, I will just put a precursor on that. I do not speak French and I do not intend to try and speak French. So... Uh, Say Levy. We're all very grateful for that. <laughs> so, uh, Gaz, just tell us quickly, what are the weather conditions? I mean, it looks to all of us, it looks perfect at the moment, but of course, parachuting needs very particular weather. Absolutely. Um, we do need to do a very, very specific set of checks and calculations. And some of you may have seen earlier a uh, small red helium balloon going up into the air, and that wasn't a child releasing a balloon. And while we're waiting for our uh, French colleagues to get themselves set for the drop, I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, the Falcon. experiences all over the world and carry out disciplines from basic parachuting up to advanced high level specialized parachuting with special forces. We also have two officers on the team. We have the OC Falcons, which is Flight Lieutenant Mike Reeve. He will be jumping today. And his deputy this year is Flight Lieutenant Jen Littler. They join the team's commandos, logistics, engineering, and the list goes on. These are some of the best French parachutists, and they are very proud of Ladies and gentlemen, if you look up to the skies, the French team Fenix have now jumped from the aircraft and you should see them coming down. Are you sure they drop? Yeah, they're out. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, they have gone round for a dummy drop because we do have uh, aircraft landing, so we can't carry out the parachute display while there's aircraft landing. What you can see now is the team doing an incredibly complicated manoeuvre and very skillful and that's linking up their parachutes to form a triangle. This takes exceptional skill by the parachutists to make sure that their lines don't intertwine and they're controlled all the way down to the ground. As they get closer they will split and create their own formation ready for landing. Well, I think you'll agree, actually, that's uh, very effective. And again, as they get close to the ground, you can see they are flying the national flag and the flag of the French Air Force. And the last man down will be carrying the flag of the French Air Force. Please, once again, put your hands together for the absolutely fantastic and formidable 
Team Phoenix. And they've already reported back that they can see the crowd down here and it is amazing and they are really, really looking forward to this. So I do want to hear as much noise on the way down as possible. At about a thousand feet they can pick up that noise and it will give them such a huge buzz to hear the crowd here today at Cosford. The gorgeous weather today means that the team are going to do a full display, jumping from around 7,000 feet. And as they come out towards the airfield now, look towards the rear, towards the hangars, and you'll see the C-130 running in. It'll come straight over the top of us. The parachutists will jump out, they will free fall for about three to four seconds before they pull their canopies and immediately they'll deploy red smoke and go into the full routine of their display. Now we've got some lovely weather here today and lovely blue skies so the backdrop of the red with the red, white and blue of our canopies will give an absolutely memorable and fantastic display. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you are watching history here today. This is the last jump by a Royal Air Force parachutist or military parachutist from an RAF C-130. And as significant is the crew today flown by 47 Squadron, from RAF Bryce Norton, a squadron that has amazing history and one that has worked with the RAF Falcons for a long, long time. And ladies and gentlemen, here they go, the 2023 RAF Falcons Parachute Display Team. And you should see one the other, and they turn 180 degrees back up the jump run. And parachutists who have separated themselves from the main group, who are our flag bearers today. And the team coach, Flight Sergeant Liam Lyons, has now called them to get into their first formation. And they're going to our dedication today, which is the heart. And this is dedicated to everybody here today at RAF Gosford, but particularly to anybody who's been involved with the C-130 Hercules, but also to a couple of our special guests here today, is Jimmy and Monica Morgan, who've come here to see the Falcons. The team are now going to go into the split. Odd numbers go left, even numbers go right, and the coach will go for a 90 degrees to go back on themselves, create two separate snake formations. Into our signature move, which is the carousel. This one is a great one for photographs. And what he's doing now is calling the team into their final manoeuvre to line up for landing. Once they're into the Andy Leach, a Sergeant J. Coleman Rothick flying the colours of the Union flag and the Royal Air Force ensign. Flying the colours, the red, white and blue, wherever we go. And leading the team in then, as I said, is Flight Sergeant Liam Lyons, this year's team coach, followed up by Sergeant Paddy Gilwar, Sergeant Greg Ashelby, Corporal Joe Finch, Sergeant Owen Collins, and last but not least, OC Falcons, Flight Lieutenant Mike Reeve.
near the front will get a great view of the Falcons. And again, a historic moment for us. We'll be doing the lineup today alongside our French counterparts, Team FedEx. And that is our last Falcon. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm sure you'll agree with me. That's an absolutely fantastic way to open the flying program here at the Cosford Air Show 2023. We are now expecting a fly past, and this is a very special fly past by the C-130 Hercules. As this, difficult to believe, but uh, in just a few days' time, this aircraft will leave RAF service. Look to your right hand side. One of the very last chances we all have to experience the sight and sound of the C 130 Hercules. The fly past is due here at 10.30 on Wednesday the 14th. If you would like to see the aircraft as part of that tour, please have a look at social media. Royal Air Force Chinook display. It's our very first public display of the season. If you look to the distance, you can see the crew running in now. The iconic silhouette of the Chinook. Just and here we go. in 1989 before most of the display team were even born jim has flown the wessex the augusta 109 the squirrel the griffin and the chinook he's undertaken operational tours across the globe and is the chinook's only current a1 instructor meaning he's forgotten more about flying than most of us will ever learn he uses the wing over to reposition for the running back along the crowd line and exactly the same way a frontline pilot will wreck a landing site before their landing. He's running in now for the famous roller coaster, pinching the aircraft up to 50 degrees from the horizontal before pushing over at the top, bunting the aircraft and racing back down towards his hard deck of 100 feet. passes crowd center he'll enter the second half of the roller coaster asking the Chinooks two 5,000 horsepower engines to offer up a big chunk of their performance before throwing the aircraft over the top of the second bunt joining Jim in the cockpit today is flight lieutenant Jamie Johnson known as JJ on 18 squadron JJ joined the RAF in 2014 and has served on 18 squadrons since 2020. He's taken part in exercises in a host of exciting locations around the world, including Macedonia, Estonia, Lithuania and the United States, and is deployed on operations in Mali. Around his display duties, he's working up towards becoming an operational captain, ready for deployment in the autumn. Jim and JJ are now running in from the right for the solo nose over. Jim in the right hand seat is entirely reliant on JJ for his patter. Let's join them in the cockpit now. Ready, set, now. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. complete their nose over they begin setting the aircraft up for the second of the pedal turns Jim puts the aircraft into a max performance climb before putting in a large pedal input at the apex reversing the aircraft through 180 degrees as they exit the pedal turn they'll perform a pass of the flight line and give you a chance to some cracking photos of the Chinook he joined the RAF initially as an armorer 
where we work, prepare the RAS now retired tornado fleet for operational sorties. However, in 2015, he saw a change of career and converted to air crew, fulfilling a lifelong ambition of being paid to fly for a living. The aircraft is supported by a huge number of engineers that keep that airframe airworthy and functional. All of them have returned to Cosford today to the school where they learned their trade and it's their absolute privilege to be able to show the endeavours of their efforts here for you. They just resupplied and gave them the opportunity to demonstrate the Chinook's astonishing power to weight ratio. As they complete the corkscrew, they'll begin a 405 degree spiral descent back down towards their hard deck. It's worth noting that all of our display activity is conducted around normal duties and operational commitments. Both aircrew and engineers work tirelessly to deliver their normal operational output and will return to work tomorrow to fly and fix helicopters and ensure the UK retains a credible air manoeuvre capability. The crew are positioning now for a run-in and break. This is a great chance for a photo of the aircraft's underbelly, but more importantly, enables Jim to bring the blade slap to RAF Cosford. more to the Chinook Force than just the aircrew and engineers who are here at Cosford today supporting the display. Every trade at RAF Odium exists with the singular aim of enabling the Chinook Force to deliver air manoeuvre. The tireless work of our air operations the only helicopter capable of this impressive feat and it's a tribute that has helped many a crew get out of a tight spot. shoulder departure. As they lift to the hover, please give them a big wave and a cheer. They assure me that if you're loud enough, they can hear you over the thunderous sound of the Chinook's blade flap. With a flash of the landing lights and a wave from the crewmen, the 2023 Chinook display is finished. It has been an honour to display the Boeing CH-47 Chinook for you here today and bring the blade slap to RAF Cosford. Please come and find us in the RAF village to meet our team. We have a very small but dedicated team of RAF regulars, reserves and civil servants who are all involved in making these displays possible. We are... memorial to those that served, honouring and promoting the courage and bravery of all those who came before us. However, we also proudly give our support and inspiration to future generations of support for several STEM initiatives throughout the virtual reality and simulator experiences. The Battle of Britain aircraft attends over 900 events with displays from flight maps, meaning we appear in front of... Flying by Flight Lieutenant Tony Cooper.
one of the flight commanders on 64 Squadron in Well, as well as her involvement in D-Day, AB also flew sorties in August 1942 during the fierce aerial battle in support of Operation Jubilee and the Dip Dippy Raid. One of her pilots, Flight, Flight Sergeant Dixie Alexandra, was credited with destroying a Donia 217 bomber in AB-910 during these combats. AB-910 also famously flew the first unauthorized Spitfire passenger, Margaret Horton, was weighing the tail down whilst the aircraft was taxiing to take off. The pilot unknowingly got airborne. Amazingly, Margaret managed to hang on and the pilot safely, safely landed the aircraft. Neither Margaret or the pilot or aircraft were harmed. Squadron, the squadron's hurricanes were used for night air defense over Plymouth and Exeter area for night intruder operations against targets in northern western France. social media, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at RAF BBMF and on Facebook at BBMF Official. You can also visit our PR stand for the shows we've got to show about the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. Let's hope all the hard work going on right now at Royal Air Force to get the next service serviceable uh, pays off and we do get to see it in some of the magic break. So just bring it up to 
date with what you can expect um, through the rest of this hour. Next on the display program is the Lynx helicopter. They'll be back to the Royal Air Force. The mighty shape and sound of the Typhoon. Then we'll stick with the jet free, but we'll go back in time. They always provide to the RAF Cosford Air Show is this station's near neighbour at RAF Shawbury. Not only do they host some of those aircraft that aren't able to land here because of the length of the runway, like the F5s, the puppy suites that we'll be seeing here later on at 2 o'clock, but they also assist in terms of providing. Indeed, I've just been informed by the
A very familiar machine only a few years ago in military hands, but now operating in the civilian world, the Westland Lynx AH-7, which comes to us from Project Lynx XZ-179. That's the serial number of this helicopter based at North Weald in Essex. And this is the first display season for this particular civilian... It certainly is, if you're in a battlefield helicopter. Now those of you who remember seeing the Lynx in its Army Air Corps days will remember we used to see the most extraordinary aerobatics being performed. Something of the Lynx's agility and its still outstanding speed because this has always been a helicopter that has been tremendously fast and indeed it's a specially modified Lynx that still holds the outright world helicopter speed record. And the easiest way to differentiate between the two was the undercarriage, this being an army version of the skids. Perfect for uh, work on Salisbury Plain without sinking into the grass too much. Whereas the navy version had wheels and casters, just the type of thing you need for turning it around and around on the very small flight. Yeah, that was the uh, raison d'etre, really, or one of them, certainly, of the links in Royal Navy service. was operation from the Royal Navy's smaller ships. And indeed, the team behind Project Lynx will be returning to flight a former Royal Navy Lynx Mark 8 in due course, which is a very exciting prospect indeed. 
The one exception to that rule that Andy just mentioned was, of course, the Mark 9 Lynx of the Army Air Corps, which had a wheeled undercarriage. It was quite a different beast in many ways, based on the earlier Lynx 3 project. And they were the last Lynx in UK military service with the Army Air Corps, retired in 2018. Mark 7s like this were phased out in 2015. The Royal Navy's Mark 8s followed in 2017. And indeed, this aircraft uh, replaced in service by a very similar looking aircraft. It is similar looking, it is very, very different. The Wildcat, where both the Army and the Navy versions are constant. Yes, indeed. We gaffed anybody who served in the British Army of the Rhine uh, for 15 years, 20 years, around that sort of mid 70s onwards. Very familiar with Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Very effective too, it must be said, and is often forgotten, I think. During the first Gulf War in 1991, the Army and the Navy used the Lynx to significant effect. On one day in February 1991, an Army Lynx destroyed two Iraqi armoured personnel carriers and four T-55 tanks, and that was the first ever operational employment of the TOW missile. Project Lynx have done here in making this aircraft airworthy again. We say it's a historic aircraft, it was in service less than 10 yes. years ago, the Lynx. It's a, a modern historic. Yes, it was. In fact, this very one was in service just uh, uh, 10 years ago. It dates from 1978. It was built as a Mark I. Westland, the manufacturer, kept it as a test and demonstration airplane, delivered it to the Army Air Corps in March 1983. Ten years after that came the upgrade to Mark VII standard, as we see here, with new electronics, more powerful engines, being the Rolls-Royce Gem turboshaft, a revised tail rotor, and infrared shrouds on the engine exhaust and it had notched up six and a half thousand flying hours this airframe in service with the army air corps by the time it was retired in 2013 it was then used as a donor airframe for the wildcat program that andy just mentioned the airframe was stripped and disposed of by the ministry of defense graham hinckley who's owned many historic helicopter types then bought it he intended it to be literally a garden ornament, a static showpiece in his garden at home. But he then decided on a return to flight project, Wheeled Aviation at North Wheeled performed it. It took to the air in a hover for the first time in December 2021, and its first proper full flight was on the 14th of February last year, and it's embarked on its display career only this season. A large number of these manoeuvres being flown at very high altitude for a Lynx. When we talk about its operational role, it very much was a nap of the earth, between trees, not over them. Um, the only way to survive on a battlefield was to be very low, keep out of sight, keep low. Get targeted information from the gazelle, largely in this case, and engage. It was, of course, the then Augusta Westland built Apache that took over from the Lynx as the Army Air Corps' prime anti-tank helicopter asset. Worth mentioning also, Andy, that 3 Commander Brigade Air Squadron, the Royal Marines flying unit, also used Army Lynx, as it were, such as this, later 847 Squadron of the Royal Navy, but it continued that Royal Marines battlefield support role. holds the uh, absolute world speed record for a helicopter. There's a lovely story about when uh, that actually took place. Obviously, the Lynx was quite heavily modified for that to happen. Um, and the route flown was over Somerset, where else? Westlands, obviously. And uh, members of the workforce were positioned as mile markers holding flares. And Trevor Eggington said how wonderful that was. Uh, uh, flying this amazing machine, built by amazing people, to break a world record. And as he broke the record, he could just pass from flare to flare with people waving to him yeah. ground. I think that's a lovely story. And in fact, that very airframe survives and can be seen on display at the Helicopter Museum in Western Supermare. It was just over 400 kilometers an hour the Lynx achieved, G-Lynx being the uh, registration of that helicopter. It had new rotor blades, it had upgraded gem engines. As I say, it still holds those records. 
Is it always been apparent that this was a brilliant performer because a development links broke helicopter world speed records as far back as 1972 as well? From 2006 they were active in Afghanistan and for a very long time they were stalwarts of British operations in Northern Ireland of course alongside other Army Air Corps assets such as the de Havilland Beaver. I think here and probably landing on the far side of the airfield to go and refuel over there. Two former Army Lynx pilots at the controls for this display, Clive Clark and Rich Misselbrook. And again that camouflage. Absolutely wonderful, the aircraft completely disappearing. see the Scheiber Turbo Falca target. Yeah, well flying and we've got lots more to come this afternoon. If you are here with young children, it is worth just having a quick chat with them uh, in case they do get uh, parted from you. It's so easy to uh, get split up in these large crowds. So just an idea to have a quick chat and say, look, this is where you should go, or this is what you should do. Uh, ourselves with the yellow and white public information marquee, which is right in front of the uh, control tower, nice and easy to find, brightly colored. Uh, you can find out all you need to know about the air show, but more importantly, it is the Lost Children Center, so uh, uh, that is where you should head if you get a special deal today. And there's a wide range of aviation books, special magazines, and some other great products there as well. And as I say, a chance to meet some of the team that put together 
uh, the famous fly pass magazine. supporters representing the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan and the team that we've not seen in this particular type of extra 300 because they upgraded in 2017 to this 330 LX model getting airborne now the Royal Jordanian Falcons and they'll be getting into formation ready to run in and start their display shortly Beautiful formation takeoff. So we mentioned we'll hopefully soon see a pit special. The Royal Jordanian Falcons originally equipped with the pit special before moving on to the extra, and I believe this is probably the third mark of extra. Yes. 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 The team started life in 1977 at the behest of. His Majesty King Hussein, himself a pilot of great renown. They started out with their first British display in 1979 and were then regulars with the pits on the European and Middle Eastern display circuits plus occasional visits to North America indeed until 1992 when they converted to the extra EA300. Initially at that time the mid-wing model, they then later switched to the low-wing 300L now and really new dimension has been added to their sequence in the past six or so seasons with this 330 lx model one of the most recent developments in the line of high performance unlimited competition and display aerobatic aircraft designed by the german aerobatic pilot and engineer walter extra and this team won of its greatest exponents you can see they've started off in box formation the smoke goes on and we present to you the 2023 royal jordanian falcons so they start off in box formation for an initial quarter cloverleaf maneuver drawing in the sky the outline of a quarter of a clover leaf and we'll soon see the first of the formation changes as from box they go into T for tango formation for the liner breast loop and out of that the team will be transitioning into a left hand barrel roll once again as if Tracing the outline of the inside of an imaginary barrel in the sky. And as they head towards the right hand end of the display line and roll out, they'll be using a wing over to bring themselves back onto the display line for a clover leaf once again, but this time to the left. Leading the team for 2023 is Captain Jamil Zayad, who joined the team back in 2002 as a display pilot. He first became leader in 2005, and he's also the director of operations, as well as leading the team through its display. He joined the Royal Jordanian Air Force in 1992 and graduated from the King Hussein Air College three years later. He's got an excess of 3,400 hours in his logbooks, flying the F-5 and the Mirage F-1 in the Royal Jordanian Air Force on the front line. So there is that cloverleaf. And they head away from us, they're doing so what we refer to as the B axis. The A axis is the one parallel to the main runway. The B axis is at right angles to that. They head away from us and pull up, but now separating and putting the spoke on for the Falcon's heart. Very nicely executed. 
Institute. He's the chief pilot of the team, having joined in 2016. He is another graduate of the King Hussein Air College, flying the F-5 in the fighter role, and then the Airbus C-295 twin turbo prop transport. with the right wing man barrel rolling around the smoke as they execute a turn to the right. Flying in mirror to the leader is the left wing man in the 2023 20, formation. Between them than the last time and once again the solo coming in Another couple of minutes of freestyle solo work. The amount of so many different famous display teams, we particularly think of the Blades team from 2XL Aviation, now disbanded of course, though 2XL still active in so many other areas. You might have seen in the static display, we have them at Cosford many times. Also, the extra 300, the mount of the Chilean Air Force aerobatic team, the Alconef, and the 330 model equips the French national competition aerobatic team, the Equipe de Voltige. Now, look out in front of you. You can see the soloist heading away. You can see the three ship heading in, inverted with smoke on. And this is time for one of the signature maneuvers of the Royal Jordanian Falcons. As they now roll the right way up and head in towards the display datum for the Hashemite break. transported over in C-130 Hercules transports of the Royal Jordanian Air Force for a wide-ranging European tour of which this, as I said, is the first stop for 2023. A wide array of appearances at some of the European continent's main air shows scheduled between now and late September. these slots by the solo pilot used to fill the gaps between the main formation heading away and returning. And here a demonstration of a gyroscopic upward tumble as the solo heads away to the right. If you look out to the left, there's the 
free ship onto the main display line. Solo heading in opposition to them. The free aircraft crossing there with the Solo going onto the knife edge. And up goes the free ship in line of rest formation for a loop. The one pilot I haven't spoken about yet is the right wing man, that's Major Ahmad Al-Rababa, who joined the Royal Jordanian Falcons in 2019, like all his colleagues, a graduate of the King Hussein Air College, doing so in 2009 as a fighter pilot. He flew the F-16 for eight years, including a stint as an instructor pilot. And now the main formation getting back together with the solo and slot man, Captain Sharif Hatouk, tucking in at the back of the formation for the final set of four ship manoeuvres, beginning with one that's absolutely beautifully executed by the team every time we see it, a slow roll in box formation. Now, an accurate slow roll is difficult enough to fly if you're on your own. Imagine then the added challenge of doing so in close formation with three other aircraft. concentration on the part of all four pilots. And out of that, against this steadily darkening sky, the team heads up and in a right-hand turn to bring themselves back in straight towards us on that B-axis at right angles to the runway. And as they do so, they'll be changing into Concorde formation. It's worth recalling that it's so appropriate to see the Royal Jordanian Falcons flying at an active Royal Air Force station because military cooperation between the UK and Jordan goes back many years. For so long, of course, it was greatly encouraged and furthered by King Hussein himself, who was very heavily involved with number six squadron, Royal Air Force. Spent a good deal of time stationed out in the Middle East. And so the team are honoured guests whenever they fly at an RAF base, but here they are coming in in now Concorde formation for the final manoeuvre of their display, the Concorde break. That was the 2023 Royal Jordanian Falcons. That this aircraft came uh, to the attention of the world through um, amazing pilots. Formidable display aircraft, especially in the hands of someone like Rich Goodwin. Everything he does, he does with style. He doesn't do anything straightforward, even that takeoff. Airborne just a few feet into a hard knife edge. He's just going to spend a second or two sorting himself out. Before he, well, before he commences yeah. his display, this is Rich, of course. There's no such thing. He just goes straight into his display. Yeah, climbing to his uh, standard display height of some 200 feet and realigning himself on the main A-axis as he comes past us with an initial three-point roll. Pulling up to about 45 degrees with a roll followed by numerous positive G snap rolls. Finishing off inverted and now using the rudder to bring the aircraft round in a 180 degree inverted flat turn. some shoulder rolls as he heads back in towards us. Building up 
some energy for a big five eighths loop with one and a half slow rolls on the down line. Just 20 feet wide, 19 feet long, and it's I am just slightly taller than it when it's on the ground. Original pits, 65 horsepower engine, over 300 in this one. So some negative G tumbles now at the apex of that half loop, finishing upright this time on the 45 degree downline and heading back down towards the display datum. And Rich will now be pulling up into the vertical. A four-point vertical roll this time, showing the penetrating performance, climb performance that this aircraft has. Reaching 1,200 feet at the top of this manoeuvre for a double hammerhead stall. Back down to crowd centre, and it'll be pulling vertical yet again. And this time showing more of that incredible vertical performance with a spiral tower. shoulder rolls to start with. Rolling inverted and they're pushing up. Rich experiencing a good deal of very uncomfortable negative G. this muscle bike is very highly modified indeed its power to weight ratio is quite incredible and there as he pulls up he's endeavoring to bring the aircraft pretty much to a stop before it then carries on in forward motion apex again he finishes inverted and returning all the way inverted down the display line his inverted pass pushing up into a into five eighths of an outside loop. Again, this is really, really uncomfortable for Rich. But he brings it all the way round onto the 45 degree down line in the opposite direction. And then as he gets to display data, there he is putting it onto the knife edge for a knife edge climb. And he performs two more snap rolls. The airframe and engine highly modified. It's got a very distinctive wing profile in particular compared with the standard form of pit special. And there, this is one of those moments where Rich very definitely is cooling the engine, particularly necessary in the high temperatures we have today. There he is, resuming things, rolling on his way down with a high speed dive from the left in towards display centre. He'll be pulling vertical, performing an accelerated snap roll to the left, snap rolling to the vertical and then a torque roll backwards through his own smoke. There's the snap roll. This is what he calls his tower of power. They're not quite falling through his own smoke, but there is that torque roll. And another high speed dive away to the left. And he'll be performing some more climbing snap rolls. And pulling through. again two negative G snap rolls to the right and a yawing turn to the left he's about to go vertical yet again slow rolling in the
the climb. And when he's established on the 45 degree downline, he'll be performing some more snap rolls. Has an amazing rate of roll, this aeroplane. And now coming towards the end of this display, Setting up to our left. And there he is on the knife edge. Excellent chance to see the very attractive livery applied to the pits. More snap rolls as he heads away. And a 200 knots for a half loop with two snap rolls at the top. Topping out at somewhere around 800 to 1,000 feet this time. And now we've seen some helicopters hovering. We'll see an F-35 hovering towards the end of the program. But here is as near as possible to a pit special hovering to a very high alpha high angle of attack if the wind was a lot stronger you'd see him uh, achieving something much closer to a hover at that point but nonetheless just look at that the smoke trail giving a really good idea of the angle of attack that the aircraft has established there in relation to the ground And finally, he can relax. An absolutely fantastic showing by Rich Goodwin with the muscle biplane. And you're able, as part of the static displays here, Andy, to see Rich's other oh, rather yes. different pits. We can't wait to see that. So, um, yeah, um, in fact, there's another historical link here with the idea of having an aircraft with mixed propulsion having say a propeller and something else and in Rich's case that's a propeller with two little jet engines believe it or not he has a pits normal propeller engine on the front and then two small but very powerful jet engines and uh, believe me that is something to be seen and something to be heard as well and we really look forward to welcome the, welcoming the aircraft in the air Yes. Crossford sometime soon, but it is located um, in a small aircraft. You have to look very yeah. hard. <laughs> Head for the Sea Harrier, I would suggest, and it's very close between the green and grey hangars towards the rear of the showground. Um, you can get up very close and uh, well, just marvel at the engineering, um, having just marveled at the pilot. I think <laughs> it's going to be one very sweaty aerobatic for many reasons. There's many similarities, many differences as well. Quite clearly, you can see the roundels on the aircraft in front very much a RAF aircraft and certainly a UK design as opposed to the more grey aircraft uh, behind it, the Bird Dog, very much an aircraft from over the Atlantic. Even though both these aircraft served in very similar roles, which dates all the way back to the first real air power role, back to the days of the trenches and the First World War. Mm. What is the enemy doing? If I fire artillery, am I hitting the enemy or not? How can I see? Well, at first they tried balloons. That didn't work because balloons were still over your, over your own lines and there's fixed aircraft developed uh, and the technology gently increased. Then spotting became a very important role. And for, um, there's many phrases used, but these are basically observation aircraft or spotters in UK terms, Royal Air Force terms. They were known as air observation post and they look quite flimsy they don't particularly look like fighting aircraft but the, the job these had was to loiter low and slow over the enemy directing artillery fire maybe naval gunfire maybe calling other aircraft attack aircraft with bombs and rockets on onto a target so they may, may look flimsy they may look light they may not look menacing but believe me, a click and a few words down the radio could unleash hell 
on an enemy. This is a really, really nice pairing because although it's not one of the themes that we're marking at this year's RAF Cosford Air Show, both of these types served during the Korean War. The Oster AOP-6s of the RAF were some of the very few RAF aircraft deployed to that theatre. It was mainly the fleet air arm of the Royal Navy that fought in Korea, but apart from some uh, short Sunderlands operating out of Japan, Sunderland flying boats, Osters were heavily engaged in theatre. This was before the Army Air Corps was established as an independent arm. And the first use of the bird dock, the Cessna L-19 as it was known then, was also during the Korean War, it having largely replaced the Piper L4, the military observation variant or L for liaison variant of the J3 Cub. The first Royal Air Force Squadron to deploy the Oster, number 615 Squadron, a reserve squadron back in November 1942. And the aircraft, different marks of the aircraft were heavily involved in the rest of the Second World War through Italy, France, obviously D-Day, and then into Germany uh, as the war in Europe came kindly, kindly on. It was redesignated the O-1 in 1962, and most of them were turned over to the U.S. Air Force because the U.S. Army was increasingly becoming a helicopter force. They were then so heavily used in the Vietnam War as Ford Air Controllers, and he said directing airstrikes by the likes of F-100 Super Sabres, F-4 Phantoms, and so forth. Um, uh, also, as reconnaissance platforms, it came at a price, though. 469 bird dogs in all were lost in Vietnam, where they were also flown by the U.S. Marine Corps, by the South Vietnamese and by various clandestine operators like the CIA's Air America. We can't overestimate how dangerous this role was. They were literally picking up stones and seeing what's underneath them. Let's fly slowly, see if the enemy starts shooting at us. If they do, we can call fire down on them. No wonder the loss rate was so high. A very, very dangerous role. And I love the naming as well. Bird dog, it's really sort of American for gun dog yes. in UK. Oster. The Roman god of the south wind. Yes, and it was a name that was applied to aircraft that were of these types here. The AOP-6 is owned by Kevin Hale, who keeps it at a strip near Swindon. This one was flown by the British Army of the Rhine in Germany for many years, as well as back home. The Bird Dog, which is now joining it back in formation, is an absolutely outstanding restoration. It's one of the oldest Bird Dogs still around. It dates from 1951. Its Korean War service is not that well known, but it's thought to have been reassigned subsequently to the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force, and it remained in Japan through the 1970s. It then spent some time later around 35 years towing gliders in Hawaii. Then in 2017, a pair of airline pilots, Shona Bowman and Laurie Gregoire, bought the airframe sight unseen. Laurie performed a four-year restoration. Some 4,000 working hours were involved in putting it back into pristine condition, aided by Shona. year to change formations. And on the right, next to the leader, Tiger Due, Salim, a real name, Serim Vetli. He is flying his fourth season with the Patrouille Suisse d'Estier and is also the youngest member of our team. Our mascot, Flatty, is also on board Tiger Due. Flatty is the official co-pilot and member of PS as Tiger Dieci, number 10, and with 1,200 hours has the most flying hours in the red and white F5 Tiger. Tiger Trev flies on the left side of the leader at the controls Major David Pereira, also known as Pepe. Pepe works fully time in the Air Defense Operations Center at the same time. on his own in action. Among the Patrouille's team, however, teamwork is the key to success at speeds of around 540 knots and distances of 3 to 5 meters. Everything has to fit perfectly. What counts here, flying precision and many years of experience. Complete concentration and trust in man and machine. Our pilots are supported by around 15 highly trained and experienced mechanics on the ground. for that 
next formation a few insights into the life of the team. Whoever is on the team here must be anonymously chosen by the entire display team. You cannot apply for it. Being here is a great privilege and at last but not least an honor for every team member. But remains a dream for many. We'll let you dream and admire for a few minutes today. Enjoy these moments with the ambassadors of the Swiss Air Force, the speed sound of our six F5 supersonics Tiger Jets. <laughs> figures and changes in formation take place at the right time and in the right place. Each pilot orients himself according to his wingman and thus keeps his exact position. In addition to the lateral distance, the pilots also fly slightly offset in height. This prevents them from getting into the air vortices of their comrades. Well, stop. Lightning, lightning, go. Here is a bit of information about our F-5 Tiger fighter jets. The two engine push the pilots in the sky to rates of climb of around 170 meters per second. The F-5 has been a reliable service with the Bad Christie since 1995. That means almost 30 years now, with a top speed of this fighter jet of around 920 knots, so about 1,050 miles per hour. Used mainly in Switzerland as an aggressor for our training, it has been in service in the Swiss Air Force 45 years now. Radio is live from the cockpit. Our program is optimized every season and the new formations are added to the program from time to time. Training on the right, the four-sided roll of our soloist JD. Speed around 400 knots.
say now, Bella Ciao to Tiger Sexy, who flies from left to right to say goodbye to you all. And to finish it off, ladies and gentlemen, a surprise. Live from the cockpit, a message from our leader the Soviet Union, there were various efforts to produce new production Yak-3s to take advantage of the burgeoning export market among Western collectors. For example, the Yakovlev Design Bureau itself built new build Yak-3s. This aircraft was used by Capel Aviation, who commissioned the new build Yak-3 program I was talking about earlier on for many years and based in France it made so left to right mostly today we've been taking off from right to left um, it's all down to the wind direction we generally in aviation like to do everything into wind if we can um, obviously, if you've got one, one piece of tarmac, you actually have two runways. You have one in one direction and one in the exact opposite direction. Uh, and if you're anywhere near the centre of the airfield, you can see the windsock, which is looking pretty sad at the moment. Hanging there very is, limp. Yes. I think at most we've got a couple of knots, almost light and variable wind. So, um, wind not a factor at all for the aircraft taking off and landing. So can almost use the runway at their own discretion. Mm. Uh, it's not quite as simple as that, but um, the Yak-3. And we await the arrival of this very impressive four turboprop airlifter, the gestation of which began in the early 1980s as an effort to produce a successor, not just to the Lockheed Hercules, but also the Transal C-160. And it was in 1994 that a full-size mock-up was shown at the Farnborough Air Show. Well, that gestation went on until the first flight of the prototype Airbus A400M on the 11th of December 2009 and it was in 2013 that it came into service with its first operator, France's Armée de l'Air. In then from the right, the Atlas C1. from RAF Akrotiri in Cyprus, C-17s and Voyagers forming the rest of the RAF Air Mobility Force at Bryce Norton were also involved along with many other RAF ground units. The first really large scale operation for the RAF Atlas fleet was the Afghanistan evacuation in August 2021. Three Hercules, four Atlas, five Voyagers and seven C-17s were involved in that and they airlifted out more than 15,000 people. So if you look to your right hand side you'll see the aircraft is configured for landing. I'm expecting this to be a low overshoot so you can see a very tactical approach to the runway here. Hopefully you can see the undercarriage has been lowered, flaps deployed to give the aircraft its best short landing performance although it won't be landing today but set up to make that approach and it will then demissions austere strip operations, use of night vision goggles and so forth. It really has brought some new capabilities or new levels of capability to the RAF. Back in November 2018, an Atlas set a new record by dropping a 23-ton load by parachute over Salisbury Plain. And that was the heaviest load ever airdropped by any UK military aircraft. And it's interesting to point out that it would take a very small number of aircraft of this sort of type or say a C-17 or indeed a Hercules to perform the roles and perform the extent of airlift operations that 70 years ago started in Berlin using hundreds upon hundreds of C-47s, C-54s, Yorks, Hastings and other types. Engine trailed by the Supermarine Spitfire PR-19 with its Rolls-Royce Griffin. This, the Mark 19. Such was the development potential of the 
Spitfire, the basic design of the Spitfire, it was developed into a huge number of marks right up to 22, 24 and even to some other aircraft such as the Sea Fang. This aircraft had to rely on speed and altitude to escape the enemy and they were frequently brought to combat. They were frequently chased because these aircraft were sent out over Europe to photograph targets both future, current and past. You mentioned any photo reconnaissance aircraft and eventually it was a RF squadron leader and photographer called Sidney Cotton who thought we need to do something about this and he managed to extract two Spitfires from the Air Ministry. He deployed his formidable photographic knowledge producing the first PR first Spitfire. He's also largely responsible for this colour, this uh, beautiful blue colour, also pink as well. Being retired, three Mark 19s joined up with a single Hurricane at Biggin Hill to form the RAF Historic Aircraft Flight later to be called the Royal Air Force Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. And this aircraft powered by the Rolls-Royce Griffin engine. Rolls-Royce at the time liked to name there engines after small birds of prey and falcons and etc. This is the Griffon, not the Griffin. 37 litre engine rated at between 2200 and 2800 horsepower. You compare that with the early Merlins in the early marks of Spitfire they were rated around about 1000 to 1100 horsepower. This easily double that. Ground today. In Amona and the Ada Dams after the famous 617 Dam Busters raid. Initial development with the Allison B 1710 engine. This may have been an American designed and built aeroplane, but it's one with very significant, indeed crucial, British influence. It wouldn't exist at all were it not for a British purchasing commission in New York, which was set up to look into potential aircraft procurement from United States manufacturers as a means of bolstering the UK's own production during the Second World War. In 1940, that British Purchasing Commission was on the search for more fighters for the Royal Air Force. And while the existing Curtis airframe And then came 
Just the brain way. Which came about as a result of discussions between the then commanding officer of the Royal Air Force's Air Fighting Development Unit at Duxford, Ian Campbell Lord, and his friend Ronnie Harker, a test pilot for Rolls Royce during 1942. It was from that that the idea of fitting a Rolls Royce Merlin engine, its performance was a revelation, and so the Mustang was transformed. Well, the Allison engine Mustangs continue to serve gallantly in such as the tactical reconnaissance role with the Royal Air Force. It was the Merlin engine Mustang powered by Merlin, built by the American automobile manufacturer Packard, making up for the uh, lack of capacity Rolls-Royce itself had while making Merlin for such as Spitfires, Mosquitoes and Lancasters, that came to hold, hold sway in Mustang inventories by the end of World War II. As a long-range escort fighter with the U.S. 8th Army Air Force from bases in East Anglia with auxiliary long-range fuel tanks. Officer of the 4th Fighter Group stationed at Debden in Essex. between Rolls-Royce, the engine manufacturer, and today's modern-day United States Air Force. and institutions where we promote and inspire the next generation to take up careers in those subjects. And of course the Red Arrows are proud to take the red, white and blue across the UK and the world showcasing the excellence of the RAF and represent the UK at home. For the 2023 Royal Air Force Aerobatic Team, the Red Arrows! one pulling the team up at four to five g and over 400 miles per hour as they collapse from the wall formation which is approximately 200 feet from wingtip to wingtip into eight arrow formation back towards the ground red one will bring the formation around to the left red one is squad leader tom bold Tom is in his third and final year as Red One. He is a former team member from 2014 through to 17, where he was the synchro leader in 2017. He is a former Typhoon pilot, a former qualified flying instructor on the Hawk T Mark II, 
and he was also an instructor on the Takano, where he was the Takano display pilot in 2000. Keep your cameras trained on the formation for a dynamic shape change as 7 and 8 perform a rollback to change the shape from 8 arrow into Vixen. As the team come around to the right, you'll see the team formed in a formation known as Short Diamond. Of course, we would normally have nine aircraft, and you'll have seen earlier this year the video from Officer Commanding Rafa explaining that we are not a nine this year down to safety. As we can only train three new pilots each year, and the maths just, just simply didn't work out for this year. However, our aim is to be at our famous trademark Diamond Nine for next year, as Red One brings the team around to the right, for the Vixen, roll. As the team rolls to the left on the right hand side of Red 1 is Red 2, flight lieutenant Rich Walker. Rich is in his first year on the team, is a very experienced aviator. He has flown on operations on both the Harrier and the Typhoon. He is the second of our space themed shapes. Of course, Reds 4 and 5 are now all the way back at the formation, which makes their formation keeping even more difficult. As all the formation references are taken off Red 1, and it's even harder for them being that far back in the formation to see Red 1. As Red 1 brings the formation around the left for the Eagle present. So, so far we have seen the Apollo space mission formation and now the Eagle landing craft formation. This is in a nod to the importance of space as the Royal Air Force acknowledges that space plays a vital role in all future military operations. With Space Command formed in 2021 and it reaching its initial operating capability in 2022. Once again the smoke comes on from Reds 4 and 5. They move up to sit along beside Red 2 and 3, sat behind Red 6 with Red 7 and 8 in trail. In May of this year, we celebrated the 80th anniversary of the famous mission to take out the dams in the Ruhr Valley in Germany by that famous 617, the Dam Busters, who obviously fly today in, in today's Royal Air Force with the ultra-modern fifth generation F-35. This is the lightning roll. On the far right hand side is Red 4, Flight Lieutenant Ollie Suckling. First year on the team, a former Tornado GR4 pilot and a former Hawk T2 qualified flying instructor. And those familiar to the air show scene will know Ollie in his former role as a flyer with the North Wales based Strike Master pair. And Ollie would like to say hello to his family who are watching today, especially his dad who's not by eye. That means they're putting the input in based on the commands of Red One. He needs to make those commands predictable, clear and concise over the radio. on the outside of the formation who have to move through the bigger piece of sky the bigger circles have to put their input in just a little bit early to ensure that the wing of the formation moves as one rather than ripples down the formation that the red arrows perform as red one brings the formation around to the right get your cameras ready as the red arrows ride the storm in tornado The go call is made from red one and the abort call is made from red seven as seven and eight roll around the smoke of the rest of the formation. You'll notice that the formation are flying with their air brakes out. That is a small door at the base of the aircraft towards the rear. This means that the throttle is now at a higher setting. It's a hotter engine gas temperature. And it also disturbs the airflow out the back of 
the aircraft. This makes, means that the smoke will burn a lot more brightly and will billow a lot more fuller, which enhances the maneuver, such as tornado. Red 7, with Red 7 in trail on Red 6. They roll away from each other, the smoke comes on as they part and perform the crowd favourite, the Synchro Heart. Today's heart is dedicated to Philip Stanton, the father of Adam and Pamela, who recently passed away. And also I'd like to dedicate it to my own family who are here today. sits just behind Red One as they perform a series of barrel rolls through the sky leaving a snake-like smoke trail through the sky in a maneuver called the Python. I talked earlier of our blues personnel over 140 of them and they wear blue to the due to the coveralls that they wear Amongst those blues are 10 individuals who are specially selected to fly in the aircraft. In between displays will be cannot take a full engineer and They are known as Circus. One individual who is with me at every display is Circus 10, Corporal Phil Dye. And he is out in front of the crowd filming the display for debriefing and safety purposes. And it's 800 miles per hour closing speed. They will pass once again within 100 feet of each other. Each aircraft performing an aileron roll. Change their smoke to white before they pull up at 5 to 6G. Reach a height of approximately 2,500 to 3,000 feet, inverted 60 degrees nose down as they complete a maneuver called the boomerang. To your extreme left. I'm pulling up. Once again, Red One pulling up at 400 miles per hour, 4G. This year, of course, we celebrated the coronation of King Charles III as Red One brings the formation around to the right. Get your cameras ready for the Enid coronation vertical break. Uh, As Edith call, Red 7 and 8, the red and blue go on as they roll around the smoke of Red 6. Smoking blue is Red 7, Flight Lieutenant Stu Robert. Second year of the team, he was winning two last year. and 12 squadron at Royal Air Force Coningsby. In a better place than when we joined. Looking to your right hand side, you have Enid running back in, smoking white. As this red smoke comes on and reds two and three roll around the rest of the formation. Clear and go is the call as reds four and five roll around as Enid perform the rollbacks which is one of the hardest manoeuvres for our new pilots each year to master. Seven and eight smoke blues, they roll around the red smoke of red sex in Vortex. Get your cameras ready for Hannah's last break of the show, the Hannah break. Off to our right, this is flight. As they perform 
the crossbow. Leaving the infinity symbol in the sky for the infinity break. Royal Air Force Coffin, it's been an absolute pleasure. Please put your hands together for the 2023 Royal Air Force Aerobatic Team, the Red Arrows! Take them back to land at Royal Air Force Shawbury, just up the road, which is where we are operating from. afternoon will pan out. Um, I do feel like I've been a bearer of bad news throughout the day, but uh, fingers crossed that we can get to everything uh, that we have planned for you for the rest of the afternoon actually here. Uh, so next display item is due to be the WASP in a few minutes time. Then that will be followed by the CAC-10, which is in fact the aircraft you can see getting airborne in front of you now. I think that aircraft is going off to the hold for a while before coming back to display for us. Worked out. We will have the F-35 at 5 o'clock, followed by the Lancaster to close the show. So that's what we're looking at at the moment. I said, uh, subject to all the usual caveats, I'm afraid. Um, well, it's been a day of changes and caveats as Andy said and uh, just to repeat something I uh, mentioned earlier the next item is in fact a replacement a late replacement for one of the current military teams that we were to have seen the Royal Navy Black Cats with their Wildcat helicopters unfortunately not able I believe for some operational reasons to join us today so Navy Wings have stepped in this is the name of the charitable organization which has really taken over from the old Royal Navy historic flight which has now been disbanded in displaying Britain's naval aviation heritage. It's still based at RNAS Yeovilton in Somerset so long the spiritual home of naval flight. The Saunders Row Company. Now we have an incredibly rare Saunders Row aeroplane in the shape of the mixed power jet and rocket SR-53 development aircraft which is among the RAF Museum exhibits positioned just to the left of the control tower, well, the Museum of the Sea Scout. But here it is in production form, running in to start its display from the Navy Wings Heritage Flight, the Westland Wasp HAS-1. interesting about this helicopter for one thing is its concept of operations because it was largely seen just as being a platform for carrying weapons it would be sent and directed by its parent small ship by other vessels or by a Westland Wessex HAS-3 helicopter to attack an enemy submarine it was able to operate up to 100 miles from its mothership. They were able to carry a variety of weapons, torpedoes, depth charges, a nuclear depth bomb. Later, they were adapted to carry wire-guided missiles for attacks on surface targets as opposed to submarines. Now, absolutely crucial is the undercarriage, this four-wheel castering arrangement, which was intended to allow the Wasp to maneuver even on a heavily pitching deck of a small ship. Those wheels of the naval Westland Lynx had already started when the Falklands conflict broke out in 1982. Nonetheless, 11 wasps served there and they did so gallantly. They flew from eight different ships, frigates, the ice patrol ship HMS Endurance, a container ship and from survey ships. And it was on the 25th of April 1982 that three wasps flying from HMS Endurance and the Type 12 frigate 
HMS Plymouth, along with a Wessex and two Lynx, attacked the Argentinian submarine Santa Fe, which had been resupplying Argentinian positions on the island of South Georgia with troops and equipment. The Wasps used their wire-guided AS-12 missiles and the submarine was abandoned. It was the first naval casualty of the conflict in the South Atlantic 31 or 41, I should say, my apologies, years ago. It was bought the Wasp by a few overseas customers, Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Netherlands, New Zealand and South Africa. Relatively small production, one run, 133 in all, 96 of them in total served with the Royal Navy, which retired the type in 1988 when the last of the Navy's Type 12 frigates was decommissioned. Indonesia and New Zealand kept flying them until 1998. Malaysia, well, its Wasp soldiered on into the first year of the 21st century. This one dates from 1964. It was just the seventh WASP delivered to the Royal Navy. It served in the training role with 706 Squadron. It served with numerous ships flights with 829 Squadron. And it had several private owners before in 2021. It passed into the hands of Navy Wings, and it's in the markings of an 829 Squadron Wasp that flew as the ship's flight aircraft on HMS Aurora. There are several Wasps now flying on the UK Civil Register, along with their Army counterpart, the Scout, and they're a really popular private owner helicopter. It's actually quite a good way, uh, one Wasp owner was telling me a few months back, of getting into historic helicopters if you're interested in them because although of course it has certain complexities it is a type that you can if you have a helicopter license quite readily learn to fly learn the quirks of and then gain a lot of satisfaction out of owning and flying Finishing his very spirited sequence, Tim De La Foss from the Navy Wings Heritage Flight with the Westland Wasp HAS-1. And what a great late addition to the flying program. I think we've almost yeah. spotted well, Jenga replacements, replacements on top of replacements yeah, on top of replacements. Very much so. But it's a, it's always a great sight. pilots on the circuit, but someone who's worked up a really nice sequence since he first came onto the scene in 2021, courtesy of the magnificent Tiger Club, based at Damon's Hall in Essex, an organisation that's furthered the cause of aerobatic display Cap 10. And it's the first time we've enjoyed his sequence here at an RAF Cosford Air Show, but he's been very lucky to be mentored by some of the leading figures on the British air display circuit over the past couple of seasons. Here he comes, Christophe Seymour with the Cap 10.
that very distinctive rasp, propeller tips going supersonic at higher power settings. And we'll hear that at several different points of this display. As far as this aircraft's significance in the war years that Andy mentioned was concerned, there was something called the Arnold Scheme, named after General Hap Arnold, the commanding general of the 1,800 yeah. students, entered training at US Army Air Corps facilities under that scheme. Nearly 5,000 of them passed out successfully. So there was quite a high dropout rate among the trainees. And PT-13 and 17 versions, the Air Corps, Army Air Forces versions of this design, carried out the primary training element of the Arnold Scheme from six bases spread across Alabama, Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. They then moved on to perform basic training on the Vultee BT-13 Valiant. So a bit of height has been gained. Ready to go into a classic flowing display of aerobatics in this aeroplane, which was built as an M2S2 model for the US Navy. It's been owned for some time by Tim Manor, the boss of Kenneth Aviation, an ex US Navy pilot himself flying the Lockheed P3 Orion maritime patrol aircraft. And Tim kept it out at Kissimmee in Florida before he moved it to join the rest of his collection in the UK at Old Warden Aerodrome in Bedfordshire. And it made its first flight in the UK at that airfield on the 7th of May 2021. And I think this is only the third display that I know of that it's done at a, a major air show. It made a couple of appearances at the Travelers Collection shows at Old Warden last year. So very nice to see it being flown here and costed on its first major away outing. fashion in his pit special he's back off to uh, Gloucester and the Lynx helicopter also departed heading for North Weald right well let's catch up then with uh, Red 11 the officer commanding the RAF Red Arrows I spoke to him shortly after the display
this aircraft is concerned. Their first operational F-35 squadron is 809 Naval Air Squadron and that's a number plate that's... Ladies and gentlemen, our aircraft is now approaching from crowd rear, so I'd like to give you a moment to appreciate the roar of the iconic engines as they make their approach now. and one we hope will stay with you for a long time after the, this display. Displaying for you is one of only two flying Lancasters in the world, PA-474. Avro Lancaster bomb is still airworthy out of nearly 7,400 that were built. She is a flying memorial to all those that served in Bomber Command and to those who tragically lost their lives. And this year we've remembered Operation Chastise, known as the Dambusters Raid, which took place 80 years ago this year. was built at the Vickers Armstrong Broughton factory at Horton in 1945 at the end of the war. She did not see service in any operational uh, theatre. The aircraft joined the BBMF in 1973, marking this. support us at the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, 
We offer two fantastic membership options through our partners, the BBMF official club.